So in the last maintenance video, we checked out some essential spares that I recommend that you'll have alongside your basic toolkits at home. Now this time, I'm gonna be delving once again into my little box of goodies and showing you all the sorts of stuff that you should try and keep at home and start compiling alongside your toolkits. They're gonna to make working on your bike a lot better and a lot easier in future. So here are the best things to set your workshop up like a pro. So let's start with the heart of the bike, the frame. So really, you wanna be inspecting your frame for damage like cracks and stuff from time to time. And make sure that your frame, you just get the most sort of use out of it. And to do that, you wanna have yourself a little kit of stuff so you can keep an eye on the framework, the paint, the welding, all these sorts of things. So this is what I recommend having. So first things first, I like to make sure that I can't get any cable rub on my frame. And that happens basically when you're twisting the bars and the outer cables, like all the brake hoses, rub paintwork away from your frame. It doesn't look very nice over time, it could be damaging, and if you've got a steel frame, you can actually get corrosion. So get yourself some heli tape, they come in sheets like this, or you can get dedicated kits for your bike. I just tend to buy big sheets of the stuff, keep it at home under a flat surface, and when you need something, you just cut a bit off and apply it to your bike. One thing to note, it is worth heating up the area of the bike, maybe with a hairdryer first, just to make sure it's warm, just to allow the adhesive to stick. Put it on a cold frame, it's quite likely to bubble or unpeel. So just a little extra tip there for you. So this is my little frame top-up kit. So ideally, with your bike, you would have had some sort of top-up paint come with it. Of course, it doesn't happen with all bikes, but you can go out and get a fairly good colour match if it's a fairly neutral colour, like a black, a navy, or anything like that. Good stuff just to top up on those chips and make sure your bike looks fresh. Especially good if you're planning on selling it in the long term. If you can't do that, the next best solution is to get some clear nail varnish or any sort of lacquer. Nail varnish is good because it's quite hardy stuff. It's dirt cheap as well. You can get this in any sort of homeware store or even like super stores where you do your shopping. Really good stuff to have and especially useful for either of those things if you've got a steel frame. So if you get chips and it comes through the lacquer that's originally on the frame, that can lead to corrosion. So it's just about looking after your investment. Subaru, have you heard of this stuff before? So this is essentially little pouches of self-setting rubber. It comes in different colors. Once you open a pouch, you activate the formula. So to start with, it feels like a kind of a Play-Doh or like um, a blue tack style material. You can, it's very malleable. You can move it into shapes. You can use this stuff on brake levers to create grip. You can make chainstay protectors from it. There's a whole number of hacks and bodges you can do with this stuff. Really, really good stuff to keep in your kit. Um, they do it in various different colors, most of the primary colors out there. So you can get fairly good matches if you want to do some color coding on your bike. One thing to note though, is it does have a sell by date. So if you do get some, just keep an eye on that and then you can always make sure you use it or give it to a friend if it's going to run out of date. Mastic tape, this is 3M 2228. And they do this in 25 mil and 50 mil widths. I've sworn by this stuff for a long time. It's electrical mastic tape very very sticky and very malleable so you can use this to make chainstay protectors or any other sort of features on the bike for protecting the bike from say rocks on a down tube really good stuff it's not the cheapest though um, but a roll does go a long way if you're just making chainstay protectors and things like that from it if you have a friend who's uh, an electrician or a sparky it's worth speaking to him so he may be able to get this stuff bulk buy in a discount, but it's really good stuff to keep at home. I've had this roll for a couple of years now, so there's still plenty enough there to do my next bike or perhaps a friend's bike. A Sharpie. Simply put, if you've got any scratches and you just want a quick fix so you can't see it in photos or anything like that, just visually, just a black marker pen or the nearest color to your bike. Well worth keeping and also handy for making notes. Next up are Threadlock compounds. Now, I can't recommend this stuff enough. It stops things like chambering bolts undoing themselves, which when it does happen from time to time, it can be infuriating if you're left with just a single bolt and a long ride home. So just keep some of that in your toolkit from time to time, just check all your bolts. If anything feels a bit loose, take it out, clean them up, put some fresh thread lock on there, and then you're good to go. Now, this stuff is a retaining compound. So this is exclusively designed to use with press fit button brackets. Now, although I haven't got any in my bikes at the moment, I have had in the past, and this stuff has been the holy grail to help stop them creaking. So always worth keeping some. It lasts on the shelf, it doesn't sort of deteriorate. So you can keep this stuff and it will come in handy at some point. So next up is the sort of kit you wanna have if you've got suspension forks or a shock on your bike. Now, okay, some of this stuff could be classed as tools, but it's all the stuff that goes with spare parts, really. It's not your typical Allen key spanners and your traditional bike tools. Now, if you're 
happy tweaking your suspension and servicing this stuff at home. This stuff will make all of those jobs a lot easier. So first up are volume adjusters, basically. So these are little spacers, tokens, and washers that adjust the air volume on your fork or shock. Now at the moment, I've only got rock shocks on my bike, so really these ones, these ones, and these ones are the only ones applicable, but I've got some random Fox stuff here just that I've accumulated over the years from previous bikes and stuff. Most of the stuff is cross compatible. You do get some newer shaped stuff, like Fox did have uh, like a rubber band style system and now they've got these clip on ones. They do the same job, they're just easier to mount onto the shock. This one in particular is for a Fox X2. They do the same job as the rubber bands that you see on the Monarch stuff from, from Rock Shocks. They're good things to have. Most forks or shocks do come with a selection of them and just you kind of end up stockpiling them. If you do sell a fork or shock, you can obviously sell them with the stuff installed or you can just take the stuff out and keep it for yourself for another project later down the line. Now, if you're a competent mechanic, you might want to do stuff like a fork lower leg service. Now, this is something that most manufacturers recommend you do about every 50 hours of riding. Now, of course, this totally depends on where you ride, how often you ride, how hard you ride, and of course, the conditions that you ride in. But being able to do it is an invaluable thing because it saves you a lot of money on getting forks properly service later in the line. Now if you do this you can replace the seals fairly easily yourself at home. They're not the cheapest thing in the world to have but they're a good thing that you can prise out and pop into the fork yourself along with the foam washers. That is something that you should get in the habit of cleaning and reinstalling anyway because they hold the lubricant against the fork leg. Quality tools is something that you need to have, especially for suspension forks. Now RockShox, for example, to remove the top cap on them these days requires a cassette tool, which is great because that's a staple tool that we recommend that most mountain bikers keep in their toolkit for obvious reasons. But most forks require a proper socket that we use with a ratchet on the top. Now, most ones you can have at home, you probably have them for your car or any other purpose around the house, but they won't always have a sharp edge. Now make sure you get a quality one, whether it's a 24, 22, 26, whatever size it is you need for your bike, and get the squarest, sharpest cut you possibly can. So you don't want any chance of that slipping and damaging that top cap because they're very easily damaged. Now, I got this one, it's made by Fox. It's no better than any others. I just absolutely love it. It's a nice bit of kit and it's orange. Now these little things are bushes. So these go in around the pivots of your rear shock where the bolt goes through and holds it into the frame. Now these are the things that get damaged just over time, just from heavy use on the bike. They're very easy to replace yourself and they're quite cheap as well. So if you find out what size you have on your bike, you can snap these up at a bit of a bargain price and just keep some in your toolkit. Or when your shock does get a little bit baggy in the frame, you can just change that before it gets any worse and your back end will feel really good all the time. Next up is a strap wrench. Okay, granted this one is massive and it isn't the best one in the world for using on smaller things like a shock can, but it's basically a grip a gripping device that you can undo the shock can on a bike with, even if it's greasy. This will hold it tight and it will not damage it. Now these are dirt cheap, you can get them in various sizes. I've had this one for doing jobs on the car ages ago, but it works just as well on the bike. Get yourself one of those, real handy bits of kit. Now, although this is a tool, I do recommend a good quality pipe cutter. This one is by Sintace and can't recommend this enough if you need to cut down a seat post, cut down a fork steerer tube for example, it gets a quick and accurate cut every single time and it's even got like a deburring tool built into it. It's a really good tool to have and it also means you don't have to have a vise, a hacksaw and a guide at home. A real neat way of cutting down a component to fit your bike correctly and getting it to fit first time every time. Lastly, if you've got a hydraulic seat post like a RockShox Reverb, then I can't recommend enough getting yourself the bleed kit that goes with it and some fluid. It doesn't cost a lot of money and you definitely will need to bleed it from time to time, even if it is just the lever end where sometimes you snag the, the hose. So just get that, it's job done, you don't need to worry about it too much in future. Next up is transmission spares. So the sort of stuff to do with your chain, your cassette, your mechs cranks, all that sort of stuff. So first up, when you install a chain on a bike, you're pretty much always gonna be left over the few links. Keep those, because at some point you'll snap your chain, and when you do snap that chain, you'll twist or bend a link so badly that you're probably gonna be a little bit short on the chain. So you can transplant a bit from that piece of chain that you've saved over. Well worth keeping a bit in your toolkit. Now to join those chains, depending on whether you've got a Shimano, a SRAM, or anything else, you're gonna need some kind of joining link or a pin. So back in the day, you could just rejoin using a chain tool, and whilst you can do that to get yourself back on a trail, it is highly recommended to use a specific joining pin or chain link. 
So in my hand here, I've got a Shimano joining pin. These were single time use. You drive them in and snap the end off. The chain will be perfectly joined and it'll be highly unlikely it'll break at that point. So they're really good to have. Now, although the Shimano joining pins work very well, they're a bit of a pain because they're so small, they're very easy to lose, especially if you're keeping them tucked away amongst other small pieces or in your riding bag. What's better is a more universal master link. Now, SRAM do specific ones for their chains. You can get away with using one Shimano chains and other branded chains to get back, but really you want to use the correct one for your chain. Now, Shimano make these as well for their chains. This is an unbranded one that should fit most chains, and this is a reusable one as well. It won't be as strong as the ones that one time use, but it does mean that I can get away with joining a chain, can fix it properly back at home when I've got the right bits, and this will fit most chains. Just make sure that you keep these in a the relevant speed to your chain, 10 speed, 11 speed, 12 speed, etc. Or preferably, just keep a selection of them. Next up, pedal or crank washers. So these go between the, the pedals and the cranks themselves, and they just make A, both are easier to remove the pedal afterwards, and you can still torque them up nicely, and B, less chance to pull the threads out of that crank. Now it does depend on the crank you have. Some have metal inserts, some don't. Either way, it's a good thing to have. They're not essential, but I do recommend using them if you have them. Now, technically a tool, a third hand, is something I can't recommend enough. You can get official ones of these that come with some chain tools, but I made this one just by cutting down an old spoke and bending it. It simply is a third hand for holding a chain whilst I rejoin it. Invaluable bit of kit, just acts like a third pair of hands. Chaining bolts. Not all bikes have them these days, thanks to SRAM kind of revolutionizing the market with the one by system, because a lot of those just have a, a dedicated chain ring that mounts directly to the crank. But if your bike has got a spider and chain rings, you will lose a chain ring bolt at some point, and it's more than likely to happen on a ride without you noticing it. So it's a really good idea to replace them as fast as possible, because that means there's less chance of the other ones undoing themselves. When you do replace these things, make sure you use some sort of thread lock, otherwise it just increases the chance that they will rattle out, because it's a sort of component that is subject to vibration. Keep a few of these, keep some long ones and some short ones, so they're compatible with different size chain rings and cranks. Useful thing to have, always keep them. Now, although not essential, the SRAM B-Tension adjuster plate is a really useful tool to have. Now we know that the settings are about 15 millimeters gap you need to have, but if you have this tool, you've got visual aid to do it. It's a no brainer, so it's well worth having one of these. And if you see one, snap it up. It's worth just keeping your toolkit. It's just a bit of plastic. Personally, I don't like to keep a chain too long because I have had the habit of snapping chains in the past and I've even managed to injure myself doing it. So I always try and keep a, a spare chain or two at home just on the shelf so they're ready for use when they do start wearing out. Now, of course, if you're gonna have a spare chain, I do recommend, if you're like me, having a pair of chain pliers. They make it so fast and easy to take those quick links out, rejoin them again. It's just an invaluable setup to have at home. And if you do manage to snap a chain badly enough when you're out riding, it means you don't have to order one online or get down to a bike shop to get another. You just got one in spare. It's not like this sort of things go out of fashion. Buy an 11 speed one with your 11 speed drive train, you're gonna keep it for a year or two until the thing wears out and you put a new one on. Good stuff to have at home. Now I'm a constant tinkerer, I'm always doing stuff on my bike. So I like to have stuff, as you can see, for every occasion. Now having a bunch of tire and wheel related spares is an absolute no brainer because I'm constantly chopping and changing tires with the weather conditions. And I do encounter various problems along the way. So this is what I like to have to make sure I can fix that stuff on the go. Now I'm a firm believer in tubeless tires and tubeless technology. The only reason I tend to carry inner tubes is just as a, as a backup basically when I'm out riding because you can't really fix this stuff that easily on the trail. Now it's worth keeping a spare valve or two, if nothing else, so you can rob the valve core should you get a faulty one or a damaged one, because time to time they do bend, which can let all the air out, which is really annoying if that happens, especially on the trail. And they can sort of gunk up as well with, as the tire seal that congeals inside them. And you can clean that, but it's a bit of a mission to do that, so sometimes it's good to just have a few spare bits and pieces like that. Spare tire sealant, whatever your favorite brand is, keep some tire sealant at home, because at some point your sealant will dry up, and it normally happens when you haven't got any spare. So just for argument's sake, keep some, make sure it's well sealed, and it'll do you good later on. Again, going with the tubeless theme, I like to have a syringe that I can inject fresh sealant straight back into my tire, mainly because it's not as messy as doing it that method, but also it means I don't have to unseat my tire. And I'd rather do that as few times as I possibly can. So this, as you can see, it's a bit gunked up from previous times I've used it, but you literally suck some sealant out the bottle, screw it onto your valve with the valve core removed, 
and just inject it straight into the tire and then top up the air. Your tire is already sealed so you don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. And it's just a great way of just performing routine maintenance on your tuber setup. So a puncture repair kit is a no brainer for any cyclist to have because if you do have inner tubes, whether you use them in the first place or you have them as a spare, it's really good to just keep those tubes going as long as you can, better for the environment. And it's good to be able to know how to do that stuff anyway. Now, because I like running tubeless, I tend to carry one of these with me. It's a little spiked prong and it has these rubber slugs or plugs on them. You can seal a hole in a tubeless tire when you're riding. Now, this is the one, it's got one in each end here that I carry with me when I ride. But when I'm at home, I also like to repair tires that I've had slashes and stuff in. Now, if you just use these slugs on their own, you stab them into the tire, you remove the, the sort of the, the fork and you're left with the plug into the tire. There's a little knife here and you can slice off the ends of it. Now that is a good temporary fix and it's really designed to be done at the side of the trail. But if you use some vulcanizing glue, which is the sort of glue you get in traditional puncture repair kits, you can do a patch job on the inside and the outside while that is in place. And you can make a pretty good sealed tire. That's ideal if you're on a holiday, for example, and you do get a sidewall damage or you have to repair a tire and you just want to make sure it stays up for the rest of the week or the time that you're there. And I've managed to keep tires going for several more months like this. So at the end of the day, if you keep using the same rubber before you have to throw it away, get your money's worth out of it. It's worth having a kit like this just to maximize on that. Now you can also buy the spare rubber bits online. These particular ones are Camel ones. It's a motorcycle brand. They're a lot thicker. They're a lot harder to get in, but they really do stay put. So if you've got the time to fix a tire, that is the sort of stuff you want to be using. And I'm going to do a how-to on that soon on GBN Tech. Now, if you're even an amateur home mechanic, being able to bleed your brakes is a really useful thing to be able to do because it can be quite time consuming if you have to keep going to the bike shop to do this sort of thing. Typically, it's an annual occurrence and at the same time, we recommend replacing the fluid. So what you want to have is a selection of stuff, including some fluid and the fittings for the brakes that you have on your bicycles. Okay, so first up, these little blocks, pad spacers or bleed blocks. Now these come with your bikes, they come in little plastic bags and the manuals and stuff. They'll also come with any set of brakes that you buy. And there's something easy to just cast aside. Don't keep these things, especially if they look like this. These ones are super useful. So you can use these to drive in between the pads so they can't sort of push in if you squeeze the brake levers. So that's ideal for traveling your bike, whether it's in the back of a car with no wheels in it or in a bike bag if you're going on holiday. Now at the other end, there's a bleed block. So that is designed for when you take the brake pads out of the caliper and you drive this in the middle to keep the piston spaced correctly for when you bleed them. Now there's various different ones for different brakes on the market. I've got a random selection of Shimano ones, SRAM, Avid, Magura, all sorts. Now that's just from over the years. So it's the sort of thing that you can build up as well. And then once you've got them, you've always got them. Really useful to keep these. Now you want a relevant bleed kit to suit your setup on your bike. This particular one is for mineral fluid for using with Shimano. These are the Shimano sort of gubbins here, but I've got used SRAM ones in here as well. Now note that I've kept these in the plastic packaging. Now the reason for that is because I use dot fluid, which is corrosive. So if I'm gonna be bleeding brakes with dot fluid, I'll put some rubber gloves on to stop my hands getting sore and irritated. It's also worth keeping the correct fluid. Note that dot fluid does have a shelf life on it. So don't get too much of the stuff, just get what you need for a year's worth of servicing, etc. Use the stuff and then recycle that fluid. Mineral fluids, you can keep the stuff in bigger quantities because it doesn't sort of go off or change. You keep the stuff on the shelf for a longer time. Just make sure you've got the relevant kit to suit your bike and bleeding brakes doesn't become a problem. Now, if you ever need to shorten or remove a hose from your hydraulic system, it's a good idea to put a new olive and a new barb in there. So whatever system you have, whether it's Shimano, Formula, Magura or anything like that, make sure you've got the relevant ones for your system. Always try and use fresh ones of these or you will get leaks, which leads to problems or failure later down the line. Keeping a good selection of brake mount bolts and rotor mount bolts is a good idea, especially if you use these angled washers and the longer bolts like Avid and Shimano do with the raised spacers. Also, make sure from time to time that not only you check your disc rotor bolts are tight, but make sure the heads aren't gone on them, because if they are, it makes them a nightmare to remove later on. Always remove them and get rid of them sooner than later and replace with a fresh one. Now, I shouldn't need to tell you this, but because of where it is as a safety item on your bike, you wanna be using a thread lock on those bolts. So again, that's where thread lock comes in handy. These ones have got thread lock on them, suitable for use, 
but if it's an old bolt, make sure you put some fresh stuff on there. Time to time, you're gonna upgrade your bike, get rid of a shifter, or maybe break one in a crash or something. It's well worth, whether it's iSpec, the Shimano system, or with the SRAM direct mount, keeping those little mounts, because they do go walkies and they do snap, and they're a bit of a pain in the ass to buy, and they can be quite expensive. Also, depending on how you like to run your system on the bar. Some people like to have the matchmaker thing, have everything off a single clamp. Other people like to move stuff around independently. It's worth keeping a few spare clamps or keeping hold of old ones because they will always come in handy at some point, be it just for holding your RockShox Reverb remote or holding the brakes or holding them both together at the same time. Being a rider in the UK, I go through brake pads quite a lot, mainly because of the riding conditions. I always try and keep a few spare sets of pads. Um, don't be tempted to take these out of the packaging because they can get contaminated easily. I always keep them, fold them over, put them in an easy to store place and I've got a big selection of pads, always come in handy at some point. For cleaning and servicing your brake pads, so if they're contaminated or they're squeaking and stuff, you wanna get some good brake cleaner, you wanna get some aggressive emery paper. So it's worth getting a selection pack with loads of different grades on there, you've got finer stuff. Also handy in other areas of the bikes, and of course a block to use that stuff with. That means that you can sort of renovate your braking pads and your disc surfaces. Now, as you can see, I've accumulated quite a lot of stuff here, and okay, there are a few tools in here, but mostly this is spare parts and the sort of things that go in association with your main toolkit. Now, this isn't all gonna apply to you guys, but hopefully there's gonna be some stuff in here that's gonna inspire you to get the extra bits in there and take on some home maintenance stuff yourself. If you want to see the sort of absolute bare minimum basics you should have, click down here. Hopefully that's a helpful video to let you know those sort of things. And if you want to find out the sort of retaining compounds, greases, lubricants, degreasers and solvents and things like that that you should have at home in addition to all this stuff, click down here. As always, click on the globe to subscribe because we've got really good content coming for you every single week now on the GMBN Tech channel. And of course, if this video is helpful and you like it, give us a thumbs up.